Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lisa Knoll, the Physician Liaison at Hawaii Independent Physicians Association, and I am very pleased to be your moderator for today's presentation. The Hawaii IPA is excited to host this presentation with Dr. Jarris Hedges, Dean of the John A. Burns School of Medicine, as he discusses how the John A. Burns School of Medicine has become an important contributor to the state's healthcare and biotechnology economy, bringing in nearly 40 million in research dollars into Hawaii every year as they address the mechanisms of disease and healthy living in key areas of health disparities in the Pacific. Today's program will explore the ways that JAPSUM is woven into the very fabric of Hawaii. Before I introduce today's speaker, let's go over a few details about the webinar. It is 60 minutes in length. There will be 45 minutes of presentation and 10 minutes for questions and answers. Attendees are participating in listening only mode, but can interact with the speaker and me by using the questions pane on your screen. If you have questions during the session, please just type them into the questions pane and we will address them verbally at the end of the formal program. If time does not allow us to answer all the questions, they will be forwarded on to the speaker who will do his best to follow up with you after the session. During this presentation, we will be launching some audience polling questions, and we hope that you will participate in this measurement tool. As you exit the webinar, an electronic survey will appear on your screen. Please take a minute to complete this survey so that we may measure your satisfaction level regarding today's program. Your feedback is very important to us as we strive to improve our webinar program. And now, it is my very great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Hedges, Dean of the John A. Burns School of Medicine since March 2008, is known nationally as co-editor of one of the leading texts in emergency patient care, Roberts and Hedges Clinical Procedures in Emergency Medicine is now in its sixth edition. In Hawaii, he is also recognized as a leader who has strengthened the medical school by building vital bridges between Jackson's community partners and collaborators. In 2013, he was named Physician of the Year by the Hawaii Medical Association. Welcome, Dr. Hedges. Aloha, my kako. Thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Lisa, and it's a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, in part, we're going to be talking a bit about the future, and as on slide five, uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, the future depends on what you do today. So a lot of what we're trying to do with the medical school is developing the future of practice of medicine, and those themes will be woven throughout. And on slide six, you'll note that Malcolm X has indicated that education is our passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for it today. Now, you really should understand what the vision for our school is. And on slide seven, you see that we serve with Aloha. But for us, the acronym refers to Attaining Lasting Optimal Health for All. So our goal is health-focused, not just the disease-focused, and also about obtaining optimal health and sustaining that for not just a few, but for all. On slide eight, you'll see some of our themes in focusing on health and wellness. We focus on health promotion, include not just the treatment of disease, but also how differences in outcomes occur with different multi ethnic and cultural groups, leveraging our multicultural, multi-ethnic population. And also, how do we integrate our care with other, the care provided by other professionals? Another common theme is that we are community-based. There is no university hospital, but teaching is distributed across our state, and in some cases, across the Pacific. We have clinical training based in our hospitals and clinics throughout the state. 
and both compensated and volunteer faculty are local providers. And indeed, we have over 1,200 voluntary faculty members with the school. The clinical learning environment is really the entire community, but of course focused on our healthcare facilities. And we also have many community service programs. Now, our role within the university is shown on slide nine. We're both an instructional unit and provide pipeline programs into health science uh, careers, but also provide a bachelor's program in medical technology. We train, of course, MD students, our primary educational focus, but also provide residency and fellowship programs. We have graduate degree programs in other areas, including the basic sciences, speech pathology, clinical and translational research. But above this educational, instructional element, we are an organized research unit, probably the second most productive in terms of federal dollars across the Manoa campus. We have a separate structure and operations for the Kaka'ako campus and have to maintain those facilities uh, as part of our overall mission. And we're also working closely with other health professionals to develop and advance interprofessional education. So on slide 10, uh, we have a number of community roles. And we train the next generation of care providers, of course. But we also are committed to advancing quality care. So that's done in part through the organized practice plan. Uh, through assisting the state and other bodies with policy development and advancement of health in the state, and building interdisciplinary models of care for the state. We, of course, are looking at not just basic science, but how it's applied or translated to clinical practice. And for a long time, we've had uh, a major role in continuing medical education in Hawaii. Uh, and that uh, program is currently headed up by Dr. Kalani Brady on behalf of the medical school working with the Hawaii Medical Association. And many of our practitioners and researchers are actively engaged in community service. Uh, I've listed on page nine uh, a number of the community leadership roles in terms of organizations that our faculty have been involved in and our executives. I don't have time to go through all of these, but I should point out that we've been actively involved in the governor's health care transformation, the Hawaii uh, Medical Education Council looking at workforce needs in graduate medical education, and also contributing in the Pacific Island Health Officers Association as a part of our outreach to the greater Pacific. Uh, Slide 12, um, we also emphasize some unique community programs. The university is responsible for a hyperbaric treatment center, which makes uh, this service available across the state on a 24-7, 365 uh, basis. We also have a HIV AIDS center, which does translational research looking at how to manage uh, the health of those living with AIDS and also deliver service through the Clint Spencer Clinic. We oversee the Will Body Program on behalf of the state, which provides the opportunity for our students to work with cadavers for anatomic uh, training. But we also work with a number of other entities to give uh, graduate and uh, continuing medical education opportunities uh, with the Will Bodies that uh, are under our oversight. We have an active simulation lab and work with many entities around training uh, on procedural and um, patient workups in, in the preclinical uh, arena, as well as taking these training tools into the clinical teaching environment. Well, I could go on with all of these programs, which are listed on the slides, will be available for you, but just note that we're actively engaged in participating with a number of efforts that both train and deliver services across Hawaii. Um, on slide 13, uh, I just wanted to remind us all of the challenges that we face. And we'll be asking some of your opinions shortly. But um, we all know that physician reimbursement is significantly less here in Hawaii, maybe 25 to 50% less than for the same service 
delivered on the mainland. We know that distances can be challenging, and if individuals have come from the mainland, maintaining from the mainland, maintaining connections uh, is difficult. And so local connectivity is very important to develop here in Hawaii. And of course, we all know there's inability to drive between all of the, uh, the practice and training sites, so we're heavily dependent upon uh, air transportation. Uh, there are limited professional opportunities sometimes for spouses and sometimes educational challenges for families that make it difficult for us to recruit even some of our own graduates back to our state. And we, of course, are aware of the higher cost of living and office operations that exist here in Hawaii. Well, based on our state demographics, as shown on slide 14, we'll note that we are short approximately 700 physicians compared to uh, mainland uh, communities. And we know that we are proportionally without the workforce on neighbor islands compared to on the island of Oahu. And much primary care, of course, is now being provided out of emergency departments, which leads to challenges around continuity of care provision. We also anticipate that the shortage will continue to grow with the aging of our physicians, as well as the aging of our patient population. That is, with an elder population, the need for more complex and more uh, multiple provider care only increases. And unfortunately, we cannot draw our workforce from the rest of the United States. A national shortage exists, and it's estimated that anywhere between 85,000 and 120,000 new physician or additional physician providers will be needed in the U.S. with our aging population. So for these reasons, we believe that it's essential that we have a breadth of services to support the workforce development here in Hawaii. And we've been working on that under uh, the auspices of our Area Health Education Center and the work of Kelly Withy and her colleagues to not only quantify our workforce needs, but also to look at strategies that we might undertake to overcome some of the disadvantages we may have in terms of recruiting and retaining physicians. So at this point, I'd like to pause briefly and turn things back over to, to Lisa Tanak. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hedges. So attendees, our first polling question is coming up on your screen right now. The question is, why does Hawaii have a physician workforce shortage? And we would like you to select one or more of the following, um, low physician reimbursement, travel challenges, distance from the mainland for those with families elsewhere, higher cost of living and office practice, and limited spousal professional opportunities. So if you would just check one or more, however many you think contributes to our shortage here, um, we will then um, let you know what those results were. Oh. And, Dr. Hedges, we have the results from the poll coming in um, pretty fast. Um, I wanted to ask you while we're waiting for that, um, do you know offhand um, what percentage of our Jabson graduates actually stay in Hawaii and continue to practice here? That's an excellent uh, question, Lisa. And we have been tracking that and actually uh, update that annually. As you would anticipate, it changes a little bit uh, for the disciplines. And we have been able to retain in our primary care area a uh, But the answers, the percentages on our first poll question, let me give those to you very, very quickly. 50% um, of our attendees felt that low physician reimbursement was the reason for our shortage. 25% felt that it was distance from the mainland for those with families elsewhere. 75% felt it was a higher cost of living and office practice. And for travel challenges and limited spousal professional opportunities, there were no votes. So 0% on both of those. 
All right, very, very good. I, um, I anticipated we would um, have agreement around the in increased cost of, of living and the re offering a, a practice and the relatively low reimbursements. Uh, so that's an, an area where um, the medical school is continuing to work with other organized entities to try to see how we can enhance reimbursement. Of course, it's always a challenge because it's tied up with our overall economic structure. But clearly, uh, we're monitoring that and seeing how we can assist uh, because it'll take a, a, an effort on multiple individuals and multiple organizations to, to address that. Uh, keeping the uh, cost of practice down and the, uh, the cost of education down are, are some of our goals such that the economic barriers are, are less significant. To, I was about to answer the, the question uh, about our retention, and I mentioned that we're uh, in the upper quartile of overall students by having around 55% re return to practice here with, uh, in a few years of completion of the residency. But also, uh, if they've done both residency and medical school here, uh, almost uniformly we have greater than 85% retention, and that puts us actually in, in the top of the nation for public schools. So it's one of our goals to uh, work to find uh, good, stable uh, GME uh, situations that we can uh, grow and keep more of our graduates here through uh, GME training. Again, because there is cost every time someone relocates between areas and the, uh, you know, the energy of activation that's uh, needed to overcome to move someone back to Hawaii is lessened if they can get that training here. So, so let me move on to slide 16, uh, make up a little time just to emphasize that uh, we're actively engaged in recruiting individuals from Hawaii through a variety of pipeline programs. And I don't have time to go through each of these, but mention a couple. One, the Doctor of Medicine Early Acceptance Program is something that was just started three years ago, and we're accepting students out of high schools in Hawaii who will do their undergraduate training in a pre-med program at University of Hawaii, Manoa. And we are guaranteeing them a spot in the medical school if they meet all of our milestones. We also, of course, have the Imi Ho Ola program, which takes those who've completed their undergraduate training, but for whatever reason were unable to meet the threshold for acceptance, but show great promise, and also have a background with some social uh, economic or other disadvantage that gives them uh, additional training under a, a very um, you know, well-supervised program. And again, if one completes successfully, they're guaranteed acceptance into the medical school. Uh, we, of course, are very pleased that we have a strong uh, learning environment that integrates knowledge through the problem-based learning methodology. And we've had, for over a decade, um, USMLE Step 1 scores uh, that have been over the national uh, average. So um, what I'd like to show on slide 17 is that uh, we have a relatively large number of applicants for a very small class size. And this year, we, this last year, we had actually 2,225, to be exact, applicants, of which 66 were uh, selected, and 90% of those, of course, coming from residents of Hawaii. And over 2,000 uh, graduates have uh, come out of our medical school. Keep in mind, however, that our medical school uh, from 65 uh, up until 75 was a two-year program where a number of our students had to go to the mainland and complete their training as well as generally residency programs there. And we really lost a, a great number of our um, graduates. A number have begun to filter back from that early period, but many of them are, are nearing the end of their uh, clinical practice time. So on page uh, slide 18, what I'm uh, indicating here is that we have a strategy to uh, deal with the disproportionate workforce um, and to get more practitioners into the rural area. Uh, we really are trying to develop more faculty uh, members on neighbor and, 
and uh, in islands and in the rural parts of Oahu that will help um, us strengthen both the uh, skill set of the uh, faculty group in terms of helping train students. It will also give our students exposure to practice settings and environments that they might not have if they stayed in the more urban uh, uh, Oahu area. And it also gives us the opportunity to expand our class size um, now with the ability to add clinical training sites. And these students, as they uh, spend time in the community, they learn about what the opportunities are there, and they also can serve as role models or mentors for students who are interested in um, medical school is in their future. So um, I think we've got great opportunity uh, to impact uh, where people are in, in this pr uh, pathway. But we need to uh, engage our colleagues on the neighbor islands and to help provide them with resources. Uh, this is somewhat limited because of our fixed budget with the state, but we're also working to try to, uh, through philanthropy, raise additional funds to help with the logistics of moving students uh, to and from uh, the neighbor islands and also uh, providing the educational support for our faculty. On slide 19, just a reminder that uh, we do have uh, rural uh, training across the four-year uh, period of medical school with uh, two uh, blocks in the problem-based learning that are given in, in rural sites and on neighbor islands. And then um, uh, also there's three. There's, there's one in the second year. And in the third year, we have longitudinal programs which allow our uh, students to spend time uh, on the neighbor islands embedded in the community working with several providers and following patients uh, over that uh, block of time. So it's a little different experience, but gives them a wonderful feeling for what it's like to be in those communities. And we emphasize in the fourth year uh, some elective uh, opportunities. So I'm going to now uh, quickly turn things back over to Lisa to um, look at our, our next question. All right. Um, now our next question, you, you really outlined it quite nicely on slide 18 and 19. The question is, what is the JABSUM Neighbor Island strategy, and why does JABSUM do it? So we'd like our attendees to select one or more of the following. Um, please either choose the one that you think is the most important, or if you think they all have equal weight, choose them all. Imprint students with training opportunities on neighbor islands. Retain current practitioners as faculty members and build a pipeline for the next generation and expand classes. So again, choose one or all that you think are relevant to the question, what is the Jackson Neighbor Island strategy, and why does Jackson do it? Um, Dr. Hedges, I was going to let you know that we had a couple of questions that came in um, on how Jabson can expand, or whether Jabson can expand to add more docs, and how we can get more residents. And I think that you've um, you've really answered that in your presentation so far. You you're working at some different strategies to right. and and letting us know that Jabson can expand. Right. Well, we're getting the poll question in. I might add that um, we've made a commitment uh, in, through our admissions process to increase the class size incrementally by 10 over the next five years. And that will be dependent on our success in um, I increasing these clinical training sites. And we're looking to some of the other uh, health systems that may have been less actively involved with us previously to also step in and assist with that. Okay. Well, we have the results of our poll. And our attendees feel um, in this order. Imprinting students with training opportunities on neighbor islands received 71%. Also receiving 71%, building a pipeline for the next generation and expanding classes. 43% of our attendees felt that retaining current practitioners as faculty members was relevant. So there you have your percentages. Well, Any thoughts on those? Yes, Lisa, thank you for sharing those and, and the response from the audience. One of the 
key things we touched upon briefly before was that if we can uh, provide the graduate medical education training here, uh, our retention rate uh, skyrockets. And so as we increase the class size um, for medical students, it's incumbent upon us to work hard uh, to grow the graduate medical education opportunities. And that indeed is a part of our strategy that we're working on. It requires a lot of collaboration both with the existing hospital systems but also uh, with the, um, the, the state in terms of how they might uh, support this effort as uh, an assist because the hospital systems uh, are being somewhat stressed as well to meet some of the growing demands and uh, for them to uh, simply invest in additional GME positions without a collective sharing of resources may be difficult. So we're trying to build a consortium around that. Uh, the, the slide 20 kind of speaks to some of our existing uh, activities in terms of partnering with local teaching hospitals, working with the Hawaii Residency Programs Incorporated that does the hiring of the uh, residents and provides their support services, and the school providing the educational oversight and helping develop these uh, training sites. But we have core residencies, fellowships, and some transitional and preliminary positions. We also work closely with Tripler Army Medical Center and the Hilo uh, Medical Center to help them with their training programs and uh, try to build synergy with, with what uh, we're doing in the Jabson sponsored programs. On 22, just a reminder that uh, all of these uh, training uh, programs are community-based and that uh, one of the things we are stressing more as a result of our accreditation process is how do we uh, develop and ensure programs around quality and patient safety and embed those in the learning that our trainees are receiving. Uh, these training programs, of course, are linked to subsequent licensure and specialty uh, practice. And uh, I should remind everyone that while our residents and fellows are in training, they also help contribute to the overall workforce here in Hawaii. Um, just a few words on uh, slide 23 about our practice plan. This is a vehicle that employs some of our core teaching faculty and allows an in integration of their multiple activities, both academic and clinical service, and allows uh, compensation programs to be developed that blend uh, and reward their different uh, responsibilities. Uh, it does also serve as a medical service organization uh, providing clinic staffing, liability coverage, billing and collecting. And we're finding that um, this is becoming a, an increasingly uh, more attractive uh, program for retiring physicians who are looking at bringing on uh, physicians who will take over their practice and working out an arrangement to, to do that with some of the doctors in training. And of course, uh, this uh, practice plan is, is linked as ma many practices are increasingly uh, linked in Hawaii to the physician networks at the major uh, teaching hospitals. So uh, on slide 24, I just want to touch briefly on a couple of our major um, uh, unique features of the school. One, we have the Department of Native Hawaiian Health that is the only indigenous medical school department in the U.S. It focuses on issues of health disparities and social determinants of health and has several um, uh, translational research programs associated with that which bring resources in for investigators and community uh, researchers as well. They also help us with pipeline, uh, ensuring that we have a diversified medical school class and uh, have provided a number of uh, service support including a recent uh, health assessment working with Queen's Health System looking at the needs of Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. Uh, we also have a Department of Com Complementary and Alternative Medicine as shown on slide 25 which has an integrative care focus. I'll just simply say here because they're involved in many activities that we're exploring uh, an exciting uh, possibility, which is a collaborative acupuncture program that would be uh, available for 
uh, health care providers, in particular physicians uh, here in Hawaii, that would be done uh, in con collaboration with Beijing University. Uh, we touched before on some of our research success, so on slide 26, just the, an interesting fact is if you look at the National Institute of Health or NIH research dollars that come in, divide that by the number of uh, full-time compensated faculty, we have one of the top 20 institutions in the U.S. But we're a very small medical school, and hence our total grant uh, dollars is, is perhaps not as impressive as some of the schools like Stanford and, and Harvard that uh, rank uh, in the same uh, upper uh, uh, grouping. Um, we also emphasize translational research, trying to make our research practical. So although we do some very active work in the laboratory, it also is intended and tied into uh, clinical applications. And just, again, staying very topical, we have one of the few uh, programs that has access to uh, some of the antigens. Now, these are not infectious, but antigens that are produced by Ebola. And as a result, we're working hard on developing uh, early detection systems and vaccines and have several grants to advance the field on that. So um, it, it's interesting, given the, the international awareness of illnesses like Ebola, uh, how important uh, this research is. We also uh, have some uh, significant uh, work affiliated with the medical school related to aging and neuroimaging that is internationally recognized. Um, I'd like to, uh, on, on the uh, slide 28, talk about um, something that we also have that is very uh, opportunistic for us, and that is uh, we have this collaboration between the College of Health Sciences and uh, Social Welfare Units where we collaborate with our um, allied health partners and can do some very significant uh, work that crosses health care provider disciplines. Uh, we collaborate also uh, in health services research with the Hawaii Health Information uh, Corporation and access to uh, hospital data and EMS data from across the state is available for research projects, and we encourage physicians who have an interest in that to work with our health services research team. We collaborate with the uh, Cancer Center and, uh, as you heard before, have a strong emphasis on health disparities. I think it's important to also note that we, although in the center of the Pacific, see ourselves as uh, connected to um, all of the uh, Pacific and to uh, our Asia-Pacific uh, colleagues in particular. And on 29, as we uh, look at the global health, should mention that we have memos of understanding with 28 medical schools in Asia-Pacific region. Uh, we have training fellowships uh, associated with Cameroon and with Thailand and with uh, Aotearoa, um, uh, New Zealand. So we have some very unique training um, fellowships that medical students, residents, and uh, even physicians on the faculty um, you know, can take advantage of and have their travel supported for uh, these programs. And under uh, Dr. Satoru Izutsu, we've had a partnership with Chubu Hospital in Okinawa for more than 40 years, and it's been a model program for graduate medical education there. I mentioned our unique ties before to the Pacific Island and the Federated States of Micronesia. Um, I wanted to just throw out on slide 30 a few of the realities as we face the Affordable Care Act. And I'm, I'm like all of you, we're questioning what the affordable really represents. Um, I think the affordable is intended to mean insurance that's affordable uh, for the individual, but it may not represent um, a span of health services that is affordable in its current format for the, for the country. Uh, in particular, we have too few care providers with our growing elders and the complexity of care and too few uh, primary care providers. So my personal belief is that we need to think about rational rationing and determining what are our priorities of service delivery that we want to make sure that all individuals get. This is controversial, 
but it's something that really reinforces the need for the medical school to work with the health professionals to look at health policy as it uh, develops, because it will impact how we're training uh, providers today. Uh, on slide 31, uh, I asked a rhetorical question of should we replace physicians with other care providers, as has been uh, recommended by a number of health policy individuals. And I think, uh, obviously I'm biased as a dean of a medical school, but I think we need to reinforce continually as professionals that physicians provide high quality and help oversee the quality control. I think we're also invaluable in terms of innovation, Look not just in terms of new treatments, but also analyzing how we deliver health across systems and how we integrate knowledge. And of course, there's an important leadership role, in particular when there are time-sensitive scenarios that have to be uh, undertaken, and in particular if there are irreversible decisions that must be made about a patient's care. So um, I'd like you just for a moment, uh, using slide 32, to picture Hawaii were there no medical school. Well, there would be a loss of an economic stimulus, some 40 million in research-related support uh, to Hawaii. Uh, there would be a lot loss of practical health innovation support that's helping our health systems advance and keep current uh, with, with innovations. Um, we would have some decrement in our healthcare pipeline, and that would create a loss of opportunity in professional training for residents of our state. And also, we anticipate there would be a, re re a reduced diversity of the physician workforce, because many physicians would therefore have to be trained elsewhere in a more um, uh, less diverse environment uh, on the mainland. Um, I'd like to uh, just talk a little bit about what I think is the direction the future is heading and some of the sort of thoughts we are using to guide our approach to training the physicians of today for the future. And on slide 33, I outlined these. Um, the school needs to continue to be a vibrant leading element, um, but not just training doctors, but as a significant part of Hawaii's economy and social fabric, as we have been through bringing in research dollars and as helping with community service. We also anticipate there will be increased interprofessional education, and that healthcare aspect will be built into what happens in our homes, schools, and businesses. So as physicians, um, we are needing to think about not just what happens in our clinics and our hospitals, but what needs to happen in the homes of our patients. Uh, we also anticipate that there will need to be strong linkages between uh, the University of Hawaii campuses and programs promoting health within our community. It is important that the medical school not be isolated, but rather be a link in the larger whole of the university and its support of the community. And finally, um, I think implementation of health care and health promotion teams across Hawaii will need to continue to embrace the peoples and cultures of our state. So just jumping ahead to slide 34, uh, Charles Kettering said that my interest in the future is because I'm going to spend the rest of my life there. And I'm interested for the same reason, because I want our state, I want our peoples to be as well prepared to enjoy the health and opportunities that are here that it is possible. And on slide 35, I just want to ask you to take pride in what we offer here as our medical school for our state. And please share these added value uh, elements that I've shared with you today. Uh, it's important to share with your friends, your neighbors, and legislators, other um, policymakers to make them aware that we have a resource and we're here to serve and to help. And I also ask that uh, we advocate for the medical school as a positive change element in Hawaii. The school is not trying to maintain the status quo. The school is
trying to work hard through collaboration, through entrepreneurial and changes and innovation to help our state advance. And I really want to thank you for your help, your support, and recognize that many of you are likely uh, faculty with our school and have made significant contributions to our students and our state over the years. So uh, thank you once again, mahalo, and I'll turn things back to Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Hedges. That was really a wonderful presentation. I think we are so lucky to have a school of medicine here in Hawaii. Um, and over the, the 40 years that it's been in existence as a four-year program, it, the growth has been so impressive. And I think that everyone in this state should be very proud of that. Um, and we have so many of our doctors, of our physicians, that graduated from JAPSM that would might not have had that opportunity to go into medicine if we did not have the medical school. So we thank you for continuing to stay at the helm of, um, of this institution. Now, I do have um, questions. And a reminder to our audience, if you have a question that you would like to submit, you may still do so. Just type the question into the questions pane. And we will answer as many as we can in the time that we have left. Now, I have um, one of our attendees has asked a question that I think is uh, quite interesting. And it goes along with how Jackson is involved in the community. Do you think programs like pa uh, patient-centered medical homes are meaningful? We know it helps get extra money to the physicians. But how do you see Jabson's um, interaction with patient-centered medical home and working with community physicians to further that concept? Yeah. Well, mahalo for, for that question. Um, we are certainly including in our educational experience, both for our students and for our uh, residents, uh, exposure to uh, the concept of patient-centered medical home and we're trying to um, build that to a greater extent uh, using the uh, USERA practice plan as one vehicle uh, to, as a demonstration for how that can work. Um, obviously, uh, each practice will approach that a bit differently. And for smaller practices, it's, it's a little bit uh, hard to uh, necessarily envision significant changes from where one is now. But with um, groups of uh, 5 to 15 or, or greater, uh, there can be some sharing of responsibility and uh, increasing use of um, ancillary personnel to help monitor those patients who seem to have the greatest health care demands and needs. So in part of our education around that, as we uh, provide our students with experience around the social determinants of health, including working with our, our home project where they deliver uh, services and support to the homeless population, they get a better understanding of the interaction between the individual, their environment, the socioeconomic situations they're in, and their ultimate use of, of the healthcare system. And they're, they're beginning to understand not only how those interplay, but also the resources available uh, working with community uh, service organizations, with state agencies, and uh, look to how they can optimize and leverage those resources. Um, one of the areas where that is especially uh, emphasized is in our Department of Psychiatry, which works very closely with a number of state agencies and city and county agencies to deal with some of the more complex and challenging patients with behavioral-related problems. Thank you, Dr. Hedges. That was great. Um, now, um, a couple of other questions. How big a role do grants play in funding the medical school? Thank you for that question. Um, in terms of support for our clinical faculty, uh, about, and our, and our, I should say, our, our basic science faculty, I would say about a third of our faculty 
uh, compensation comes from uh, grant-related activities. Uh, in terms of additional support, um, the grants provide a significant element of covering the infrastructure cost. So um, let me just draw a quick distinction between the medical school and the uh, rest of UH Manoa. Um, at UH Manoa, state dollars and uh, tuition dollars come into Manoa and off the top, the facilities which includes uh, you know, the buildings, their repair, the utilities, uh, the security, um, the, and the personnel costs, and all of the operating costs of running a campus are taken off the top, and then uh, the support, remaining support is given to the different teaching units. At Kaka'ako, uh, we have a similar situation in that we have to cover those same costs, but they come out of the medical school's budget. And so a large proportion of the um, indirect cost that is earned by uh, the medical school goes to cover the cost of the facilities and their operations. Um, in addition to that, uh, the medical school, despite having to cover its own costs, has to give away half of the research indirect dollars uh, and those are split between the rest of UH Manoa and uh, UH system. So in some ways, uh, the medical school is subsidizing through their research effort the, the rest of UH Manoa and the system. So uh, it, it, it's a complex financial arrangement and, uh, you know, sometimes it's a bit frustrating. The other point to, to make is that uh, within each of our major teaching hospitals, there are um, spaces that have been identified for teaching purposes that we must lease from the hospitals at fair market value, and it's that um, synergy where we're uh, purchasing that uh, support for those uh, faculty based at the hospitals that is often invisible uh, to the rest of the community. And that's, again, an added cost that it goes in the order of millions of dollars each year that uh, the medical school must bear on its own, and uh -huh. it's not paid for by UH Manoa. So um, you asked about, how, you know, how, what's the impact of all those research dollars? Uh, they certainly give a lot of um, uh, funds to the community through the support of faculty who are in staff executing those grants, but they also help cover a lot of the infrastructure costs, right. uh, not just at Kakaku, but the rest of UH. And and there's still some major fundraising efforts then on the port on the part of Jackson. Um, We're always seeking to raise money. Always seeking to raise funds. <laughs> okay. Well, we have a we have a really interesting uh, question here, Dr. Hedges. Would you speak um, about the present state? and the future of the Imi Ho'ola program? Yes, um, the Imi Ho'ola program um, it began as a post baccalaureate program uh, called the, the Dean's Guest Program. But um, approximately 20 years ago, it, it started 40 years ago, and about 20 years ago it, it became the Imi Ho'ola program, and um, it is sponsored in part, we actually expanded with the help of Queens Medical Center that made a grant to the Department of Native Hawaiian Health, we're able to expand the number of trainees in the EMI program uh, to any given year to be between uh, 10 to 12 uh, trainees. Uh, so uh, that was a, a very much appreciated uh, gift from Queens. And we're attempting to sustain that and working with Queens to uh, continue uh, at least a portion of that educational grant. Uh, they have extended that uh, an additional five years, so uh, we feel very good about that and we'll continue to emphasize the program as one of the pathways into uh, the medical school. Okay, thank you. Um, just as a, a matter of course, we know that, that medical school is four years, and then you've got residency, and then you have specialty training, and it seems to take so long for, 
for physicians to actually get out there in the workforce. Is there a way to safely shorten medical school and, and get physicians out into the community faster? Do you have ideas about that? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, that, that can be approached a couple of different ways. Uh, we have not uh, implemented a, a process of shortening the pathway, but the need is, is great. Uh, what some institutions have done is they've partnered with an undergraduate program to uh, reduce the number of years as an undergraduate and then maintaining virtually the full um, you know, four years of medical school. Other institutions who have taken a similar pathway have condensed their four-year experience into a three-year experience. Um, that can be uh, successfully achieved, but it does require that uh, for those who are on that shortened path that you have a very focused uh, um, approach and that also some of the support services to help those trainees keep pace need to be reinforced because um, unless you have um, students who are of the quickest uh, learners uh, you are going to have to kind of help them, guide them uh, through some very uh, complex material in a more rapid manner. Uh -huh. and, and, and so we have to find a balance if we take that approach. Um, the other, the other uh, possibility, which I have proposed and been exploring, uh, looking for uh, potential uh, you know, avenues uh, in this direction, would be to reduce the graduate medical education training period and to um, provide uh, training that's targeting a more ambulatory practice with uh, fewer years of postgraduate training. Um, that is something that is still in a very uh, explorative phase and uh, there's certainly no decision been made to, to go in that direction. But we continue to look at uh, these alternatives our current curriculum is structured such that uh, shortening it to three years would be uh, challenging to implement, but we'll, we'll continue to look because I think it certainly uh, warrants uh, consideration given the long amount of um, you know, training that is currently required. Okay. Well, we have time for one quick question, and I hope I'm not going to throw you into the fire for this one. But um, it is an interesting question. Um, when you talked about how JAPSM is, you know, a lot of the uh, money that comes in helps to the infrastructure and it helps the University of Manoa campus. Do you think that JAPSM should split from the Manoa campus? Or is that, is that anything that would ever be considered? When, when the uh, Kaka'ako campus was envisioned, uh, the, there was considerable dialogue around uh, the campus functioning uh, totally separately. And one of the reasons, a very wise reason, to uh, separate out the um, operational and facilities costs is that the uh, monies that come in from federal grants can be associated with a higher indirect rate if, if the Kakaako campus where the medical school and cancer center are are kept separate from Manoa. So we've leveraged and used that advantage. Um, a complete separation um, has the risk of some redundancy in some of the administrative uh, oversight. However, uh, we have been uh, initiating some dialogue around this because the nature of how medical schools, cancer centers, and other health focus entities work in close conjunction with the community hospitals uh, raises the issue in terms of whether there's a major cultural difference between the Manoa campus and the health science campus. So we're trying to find that sweet spot that maintains a very tight intellectual linkage, does not lead to a significant reduction of uh, services but at the same time uh, acknowledges the differences between health sciences education and that of an undergraduate uh, you know, liberal arts uh, education. And uh, 
it's not off the table, but there's no formal proposal at this time to uh, separate the campuses. But it is something that we're, we're continuing to look at what are the advantages and disadvantages. Oh, that's great. That was very well answered. Sorry for that. <laughs> no, 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 I, no. I think it's very relevant. Well, on behalf of Hawaii IPA and our audience today, I would like to thank you, Dr. Hedges, for sharing your expertise and insights with us. And thank you, audience participants, for taking an hour out of your day to join us again for our monthly webinar. This concludes today's formal program. And we very much appreciate if you would take a minute to complete the electronic survey upon exiting the webinar. We also hope that you will join us for other upcoming programs in our monthly webinar series. Next month, um, on November 12th, we will be presenting Aloha Kidney, a no-cost resource for you, your staff, and your patients. And then in December, we will be looking at community resource assessments. Again, thank you, and have a wonderful day. And do be safe this weekend with Hurricane Anna. Batten down your hatches. Bye-bye. Aloha.